right, hello everyone. My name is Miley Oye, and I'm a developer programs tech lead with Google Webmaster Central. So today is gonna be great, because I know all of you can make a great site for users, and we're gonna combine that knowledge that you have to create a site for users with new knowledge about how to create a site that's search engine smart, and then between the two, you have a really powerful experience that can get a lot of conversions on your site. So today's goal for me is actually to create a really good environment where all of you um, can feel like we're learning from each other. So you have questions that you can ask me, I have stuff I'm gonna show you in my slides, as well as present some examples of things not to do. So if you happen to see something that you've done before on the slide, and you think to yourself, oh, you know, gosh, that's me. Remember that in this session, there's gonna be no shame. So <laughs> you could just take this lesson learned, um, get home, fix it at some point, and we're all gonna move forward. All right, so here's to a great web experience for all of us. In the agenda, first I'll just do an overview, um, telling you about some basic things about what I'm gonna talk about. Next, we'll talk about the size of the web puzzle. And what this means is just how Google search engineers start to understand how we crawl and index the web. And then after that, we'll do search-friendly development from start to finish. So that means um, from planning your site, and that's in italics because we actually have a small announcement to make there, then to designing your site. Next, we'll get to choosing technologies. So now that you've planned a site and you've started some site architecture, you could think about things like Flash and JavaScript. Next, we'll talk about making the page, so what you can put in the head of your HTML file. And then adding content like text and images and videos, as well as responding appropriately with response codes, and then engaging the community. It's a big presentation, but if you have questions, just go up to the mic and I'll take those at any time. All right, so in a nutshell, if you were to leave in five minutes and didn't want to hear these cool announcements I have, um, what I want to let you know is there's an SEO starter guide. So if you just query Google SEO starter guide, you'll probably get that. And it's just some basic ideas. Um, after that, read the FAQs in our help center, uh, verify your site and webmaster tools, keep your site clean and secure, secure is a big one. Uh, and then of course, subscribe to our blog to get updates. And then if you have, the, um, you have specific questions, you can go to our webmaster help forum. Uh, and there it's monitored by Googlers and also by super users in our community. We have some here today. Um, in over 15 languages. So that's everything that you need to do, but we're gonna go into some great detail here in this presentation. First I need to just give a mention as to what my focus is. We're gonna be talking about organic search. And there's a big difference between that and the paid search that's advertising. So again, this is organic search where it's free to participate and there isn't money changing hands. All right, this is the size of the web puzzle. And what this is, is a picture of a globe, the Earth, which represents the World Wide Web. So that's a very vast internet <laughs> and web experience. Inside that we have a subset, and that's gonna be the yellow circle. So the yellow circle is everything that Google is able to crawl, and we know we haven't reached the end of the web yet. So again, that's a subset of the entire web. And then within that is what we can actually index and return in search results, and that's the green segment. So it's not enough just to make a site and stick it on the web, right? Because there's so much out there. You actually need to make it crawlable inside that yellow circle. And then even furthermore, return in search results would have to be inside the green. So there's steps you can take along the way to make sure that your site appears in search results. You can see evidence of this in webmaster tools. Here if you submit a sitemap, in that red circle, you'll actually notice here's all the URLs we extracted from your sitemap but even a smaller number, in this case about 700 less, is what's actually in our index. So again, we can't index everything because a lot of it's boilerplate duplicate content information, so you really wanna make sure that we not only crawl your site, but we actually index a large majority of your good content. This is what our engineers have to face, but let's look at Webmaster Tools now. Uh, if you haven't verified your site in Webmaster Tools, I'd like to introduce you. So Webmaster Tools, this is the audience. Hello developers, uh, this is Webmaster Tools. Here you have Message Center, which is a great way for us to communicate with you any notification we might have. So one might be, which is the second notification here, is that we're actually telling webmasters that they have malware. So again, that's something you might not know, you might just kind of someday realize you have 
a malware notice when you click through to your site, but you could have found that out if you were also verified in Webmaster Tools. You can, you can actually verify multiple sites here. And verification, verification is really simple. It's just an HTML file um, in your root directory or a, H or a meta tag that you put on your homepage. All right, so moving on. Planning for a new site. This is very exciting. It's like planning for a baby. <laughs> um, all right, so full steam ahead if you have some great ideas. Great ideas would be, I have unique content that I'm gonna create, uh, or I have a compelling product or service. Now, unique content in this example is my cousin's wedding blog. <laughs> so good for her for getting online. Um, anyway, she tells you about the tuxedos that they're picking out <laughs> and flower arrangements, which is really exciting <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, and the next part is just Google. So if you have a good service or you have great content, look to make a site. You might want to fine tune your business plan, however, if you're just looking to have a made for AdSense site, looking to get clicks. Um, this is actually my uh, ex office mate's site before he came to Google. He did a lot of these. <laughs> Where not much is being said, he's just trying to get some ads. Kind of just pollutes the web, I think. So when it comes to selecting a domain name, um, you want to think about what you want your site to target. So there's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, if you want to target international visitors from all over the world, you might want to get something like a .com or a .net or .info. Or alternatively, you can get the .co, .fr versions of your same domain. But again, there's a two-pronged approach here. So know that uh, if you want to get a CCTLD, country specific, then you can only target users in that region, at least through Google. So if you get like a example.com, I'm sorry, example.fr, you can't then use that domain to target users in the United States. It's going to be specifically for a French audience. The next thing you want to do is also think about hosting yourself or hosting on Blogger, WordPress, or AppSpot. And most cases, people say if you'd like to get the most authority, then you're going to want to self-host just to show your own domain. And the next part is about choosing a www or non-www version of your site. And this is important because of page rank dilution. You don't want two versions of your site out there that people can link to, you know, dispersing your links between two sites. So, dang, page rank dilution. So again, I wanted to keep this friendly so that we don't kind of shame any site, but um, I do a simple query for like mobile phones, and here's one that comes up. And I kind of try to white out their name, but obviously you can see they have two versions of the same thing running. With the geographic target that we talked about, you can actually set this in Webmaster Tools. So again, if you have a country generic TLD, then you can go ahead and pull down to select where you want to target it to. If you're just targeting users for a certain language like Spanish, then you shouldn't be using this geographic targeting tool. It's just for a specific region. The next thing you want to do is determine where to host. So I wanted to list this here just to give you a rundown of all the factors. So when you pick a domain, we're going to look at different factors to determine where you're trying to target. So first we look at TLD, as we've talked about. Next we're going to look at whether or not you set a geographic target in Webmaster Tools. And then next, we're going to look at your web server's IP address. So if you give us none of the other two signals, then you want to choose a web server in a location where you're going to also serve your users. Um, this can run into problems like, say, in Europe. We've seen this before, where they're hosting maybe in Switzerland, but they want to target users in Spain, but they've set nothing else up for us. So actually, that becomes kind of something that, we might, that you might want to think about when it comes to web server IP. Another question you might have is about using shared hosting. So say you say, I'm going to use shared hosting, but I don't trust anyone else on there. There might be spammers there who are doing bad things. You know, I might be associated with bad neighborhoods, and that's actually not the case. We'll actually keep those separate. So if you use shared hosting, don't worry about repercussions from other domains on the same host. Uh, and the next thing, if you actually buy your domain from someplace like GoDaddy or you use Strato, they use the Webmaster Tools API and Access Provider Program. And what this allows them to do is automatically, once you purchase your site, also verify your site with Webmaster Tools, and then give you click-through to Webmaster Tools, kind of using Google Apps. So all of that can be available if you use something like GoDaddy. Which leads me to the Webmaster Tools API. So here's our first little product announcement. We have a GData API that currently has functionality like add and remove sites, um, submit sitemaps, verify your site, change settings, a whole bunch of these things. But we're adding more and more on. What was just recently added was crawl errors. And so hopefully in the future, we'll get this more and more robust. And if you're developing sites for multiple people, 
then you can use this to actually manage and maintain these sites and understand how they're doing um, in search results and also with our crawler. Moving on to designing your site. This is a pretty meaty topic. We're gonna talk about site architecture. This is important in three main areas. So users can find what they want, so crawlers access the content, their good quality content, and also so that as a search engine, we index your content optimally. So and let's talk about first for users. A big thing is navigation. So you want easy navigation for your users in these three main areas. First, when they come to your site, they can determine their location. What helps with that are things like breadcrumbs, right? If they clicked a link from somewhere else to let's say women's high heels, they wanna know what category is this and how did I get here? So breadcrumbs give them a good indicator of where they're at. Next, a user's probably gonna ask about where do I wanna go? I know where I wanna go, how do I get there? And you wanna help your users get where they wanna go. So things that are helpful are a search box, logical category navigation, and also think about if they come to a child page, how can they get back to the home page? Or if they come into your home page, how can they get to the appropriate child page? You also wanna let them know what they've already visited. And this comes in the form of links that are colored when they're visited, also in maybe things like items you've also looked at. So that's for users in terms of navigation. Now for users for URL structure. Shareable URLs are always good, so that I can have a URL, I can give it to my friend through email, and they can find the exact same item. Uh, descriptive file names also help users as well as search engines. So you have keywords here separated by hyphens, like g1-phone. And then, of course, you have low, lowercase URLs for the safest, safest implementation, meaning that users might manually type this into their browser, it's easier if it's lowercase. Also, if it comes to wanting to block content, keep in mind that robots.txt is case sensitive. So it's harder to do combinations of every word if you're using a robots.txt file with mixed case. Now let's get inside architecture for search engines. You wanna first think about what's gonna be private versus public and secure that private data. When it comes to having a site that has adult content, think about separating adult content from family friendly content. And this is because for things like safe search, it's much easier for us to filter if we see a directory structure that's logical. So, I don't know who does adult sites, but uh, go ahead and separate that between the two. And of course, um, for search engines, static links are always best, right? Because we can follow those and they have good anchor text. Keep important pages well linked from the home page. This means don't hide it in some child leaf node. If it's a really important product, bring that up and link it from the home page. And of course, submit a sitemap. Um, these are XML sitemaps, often from sitemaps.org. Um, followed by Yahoo and Microsoft and ask. Okay, so now we're gonna get some fun stuff, like what can I disallow, right? Again, we have that size of the web problem where there's all that content out there, then there's some content we crawl, and then some content we index. You don't wanna get a stuck crawling stuff that's not good. So you can actually disallow shopping carts if you happen to be doing this type of implementation. Because Googlebot will never go through your site and actually purchase books and uh, give that conversion that you want. So go ahead and disallow things like shopping carts, um, login pages as well. He forgot his username. He probably will be logging in. Um, and you could test all these types of disallows through the robots.txt generator and testing tool and webmaster tools. So here you could test everything before it goes live as well as help create a robots.txt file. All right, so this is kind of fun, but we're gonna talk about dynamic URLs. Um, and the reason we're gonna do this is because I'm gonna channel people from my crawl team here <laughs> who have had serious headaches when dealing with things like this. Um, I'm sure most of you create sites that are dynamic and not static based, so let's talk about this for a while. Dynamic URLs are often recognized by name value pairs, right? So you have a name like category and a value being one. The name answer, value equals 10. Um, often we see this through cookies, so you know it's, hide it's hidden for the user details. But if you want your site to be accessible without cookies, um, with cookies disabled, then of course you're gonna have to go back to these dynamic URLs. A great practice for our crawl team and for us and to make sure that we understand your site is to create algorithmically easily understood, i.e. standard, dynamic URL structures. So take a look at this. We have four URLs here, and they're all actually gonna lead to the one product page for the G1 phone but they differ in terms of different parameters set on there, like category, as well as affiliate ID, um, and the two, the affiliate ID changes. So you might have a site that has a thousand products, 
you might have 10 URLs that could actually link to each product. So now you've created a site with 10,000 URLs when actually you only have 1,000 good product pages. Now Google comes along and we see that you have 10,000 URLs, right? But we can't crawl all the web. We're trying to limit our resources to crawl what's useful. So given a list of 10,000 URLs, what we're going to do is we use our algorithms to understand what's an important parameter, what's an irrelevant parameter, and we go through and go through. So we might start to see category equals mobile didn't change this that much, the content much. So category, let's, let's think about that not being relevant. Affiliate ID, and then one, two, three, four, affiliate ID five, six, seven, eight, didn't change at all. Let's definitely throw that out. So we start with 1,000, we start to prune that down as we see what becomes relevant and what becomes irrelevant. So when you stick with these types of standard formats, if you want to be found in search engines, this is much easier for us to process, right? Because we're not going to go out and crawl all 10,000. We're going to find out ways to just crawl the most important of those. So when we do crawl, you want to crawl your important content so that we can index that and return that in search results. So this is great. Uh, one reason why people might not have done this in the past is they thought ranking reasons. They thought, oh, I need to put keywords in my path because that's better for ranking, which isn't the case. We'll actually interpret keywords from whether they're in the path or within the actual name value pair. So if you have a G1 phone that you're hoping can rank for this, either place is actually going to be fine for ranking, but in terms of how we process your URLs, that second example with a standard pair is actually easy for us. So we're more likely to find more of your good content and not spend time calling your duplicate content. All right, so <laughs> my girlfriends and I tend to call things mavericks um, when it's not what we want. Uh, <laughs> and so one way we're going to look at this is called maverick um, alternative encodings. So these are developers who thought, you know what, I'm not going to stick with a standard. No, no, no. I'm going to try something new. Um, and this is really hard from a search engine perspective to process because we can't apply our algorithms anymore. So in this case, um, this company decided to do their own encoding where W0 equals question mark and QQ equals ampersand. Again, if we see 10,000 URLs and they only have 1,000 products, we can't make out which ones to crawl. It all looks like static URLs, right? We can't see anything, anything different between the two. Um, luckily, we were able to diagnose this, but you could see from your standpoint, you really don't want to leave that in our hands to have to make those type of decisions. It's fairly um, tough to do. So some other examples. Um, people putting session IDs in their path or in some positional value. Again, this creates an infinite space. So we can't start narrowing down from 10,000 to 2,000 to 1,000 URLs, right? If you put your session ID in the middle of the path, which I think was a default for some um, web servers, unfortunately, uh, that looks pretty infinite to us. We're not going to be able to know that that's actually not uh, valuable. And then some people do it as positional value where you're the only developer who knows it's going to be like this, it's really hard, again, for as a search engine to understand what's actually valuable here. Again, think about it from our perspective. If you want to be found by a search engine, then we need to be able to, be able to process this algorithmically. I have a few other cute ones. Okay, this is my favorite. <laughs> um, I don't know if this developer is out there wearing some badge of like, yeah, I did it. Um, because what they've done here is done category navigation but with this uh, binary encoding of what's expanded and what's collapsed. Uh, <laughs> okay, now let's put on your search engine cap again. From our perspective, our crawl team wants to crawl every category page and every leaf node page. We don't want to spend time having everything expanded and not knowing to get to your leaf node pages, right? Because there's so many URLs now, we can't make this out. So some good tips are if you have you know, a lot of navigation, maybe just expand one uh, category at a time, or maybe there's other things you can do. But the idea here is keep it standard so that we don't have to deal with something like this. All right, so know that from Google's perspective, we really want to help you out. <laughs> we really are trying to crawl this. That's why we've kind of diagnosed some of these sites. So if you verify your site and webmaster tools, we'll actually give you an infinite space notification if we think that you've got a problem. <laughs> Um, and this can be things like calendars or this type of positional encoding that you've seen earlier. So in this example, we're actually sending you a message that says, Googlebot found an extremely high number of URLs on your site. And then we give you ways to diagnose that. All right, so now we talk about indexing and URL structure. You want to have pretty sweet anchor text. So if I'm Webmaster Tools, I'm linking to our blog. You can see here my anchor text actually says Webmaster Central Blog. What you don't want is something like click here, because that's not descriptive. 
Okay, now let's get into choosing technologies, and here's where we have some cool product announcements as well. First with technologies, always remember, HTML is your friend. <laughs> Progressive enhancement's always a good way to go. So there's a lot out there, but HTML is accessible, you know, can be seen on a lot of devices, whether it's a desktop or mobile phone, on top of which uh, you can, you know, you'll just reach the largest audience, um, it'll be crawled well by search engines, that's, that's pretty given. Um, and then with progressive enhancement, you can add this other stuff later, right? So you still might, might add Ajax or you might want Flash, but you can do that in addition to your beautiful static HTML. All right, so moving on to something like JavaScript. Here's something cool that we just want to let you uh, know up front here about our status. We're actually um, innovating all the time with our crawl team, and we can now process on-click events. So what this means for you is that if you had a site that didn't have some URLs indexed because it was JavaScript executed, um, now we actually hopefully can reach more of your good content. So know that this functionality is being continuously updated, right? We're not in the perfect state, but we just want to make you aware of what's going on. Uh, so how are we doing this? We're actually constructing a page, um, much like the browser, we have a lot of the, the DOM structure there, and we're adding things like the link tags and form elements to find some of these on-click events. We can also do an on-click if, if it calls a function um, and creates a URL or an anchor, but only if that function is defined on the page itself. We are not yet at the point where we can externally load resources. So to give you a better idea, I'll just have you look at some of these. Um, so these are examples that we are now able to process from your site. So again, this is Google's new capability with JavaScript on-click. See here, there's window open, calling functions, etc. All right, let's talk about Ajax. <laughs> All right, so while we could do some of this stuff with JavaScript, we're not yet there with Ajax. Kind of those RPC calls and such going on, um, we're not at that point. So if you, it's important to you to get your Ajax site crawled, then you're still going to want to do something like Hijax, where you create a static link in addition to your Ajax. we're working on, but we're not there yet. Again, we're just letting you know about JavaScript. If you have questions, you guys can go up to the mic, for sure, at any time. All right, for Flash. So you might have seen this announcement before. We have more to say, though. Uh, we can find all the user visible text in a Flash file. So we're actually going through, executing buttons, doing things like that. And we can associate the text we find with your file itself. Um, so if you don't want text found, then put it in an image, because we won't still capture text and images. Other things to um, know about this is that it's been a, a huge boon to our users. Before, we had no snippets showing for certain Flash files. We just had the title. And now they see something much prettier. You can um, embed your Flash using the standard techniques like Swift Object and Swift Object 2. But our big announcement here is that previously, we couldn't load external files into your uh, Flash file. But now we're actually able to associate any external files, um, externally loaded files, and actually bring that in with the Flash itself. So again, that's a big improvement for us in terms of crawling Flash. So we have two big announcements here with our crawling team. We have JavaScript on-click, as well as this ability to use externally loaded resources. A big thing that I think that talk about at developer conferences are frames and iframes. So I just wanted to cover how we deal with these from a crawl and index perspective. Uh, frames and iframes can all be discovered at crawl time within the parent page. So you don't have to have a separate link to the frame or iframe. We'll actually interpret it within that parent page. When it comes to indexing, though, there's going to be a slight differentiation. Uh, frames will be processed with the parent, while iframes will actually be treated and indexed as a separate URL. And the reason that's the case, go ahead. The reason that's the case is because historically we've seen a lot of ads in iframes, and so there was no use to actually bringing that into the parent page. Yes. If you have content on that site, um, on your site, that people are using, uh, their friends are chatting about stuff, all of that information that people are chatting about, you will not, that stuff won't be indexed by, uh, by Google? Um, most likely not with Friend Connect. No. Okay. And also, do you have to be logged in for a majority of that, or is it public? Okay, so this person says you can see the discussion, but... Um, 
Okay, I think with Friend Connect though, we're still not processing that content. Okay. Yeah. But we can look to do more of this. This is just our current treatment of iFriend. But thanks. Um, so this is a kind of a big topic within our team is what we're gonna do with some of the things like Friend Connect. Okay, so now let's talk about making a page. We've talked about selecting a domain. We've talked about site architecture. We've talked about choosing technologies. And now we're just gonna actually make the page. So using your head. So all these things we're gonna put in the head of our file, or we can. But first of all, let's look at what a search result looks like. All right, so there's a title, and that corresponds to the title of your page, right? There's a snippet, which can either be found within the context of your page or used from a meta description, which is again in the head of your page. Then there's the URL as well as site links. And the site links are calculated algorithmically, um, done especially if you have a site that's very accessible to search engines. And it's gonna be the high result. So looking at titles, you want to create unique titles as well as descriptive meta, as well as descriptive meta descriptions. Um, again, because they can be used in the snippet. So here's an example of a meta description, meta name, description, content. Google Friend Connect instantly awakens and strengthens the community that visits your site by enriching it with social features. Again, it's, pretty, it's not too long, which is good, and it gives the user a good snippet should this be shown in search results. The next thing you can put in your head is rel canonical. Have any of you heard about rel canonical? Okay, okay, a few people, all right. So what this is, oh, sorry, before I get on to that. Um, here's an informative title. I recently had a hair salon mistake. And um, so if I were to search for grow healthy hair, something I could see here is that these titles actually contain my keywords, right? So it's good to have these, good, these unique titles. Uh, again, untitled, not informative. All right, so in terms of titles and meta descriptions, you can use webmaster tools. And this is gonna point out to you where you have duplicate titles or duplicate meta descriptions or titles that don't exist. Okay, so rel canonical. Again, we talked about all those dynamic URLs and something you might have been asking is that it's creating a lot of duplicate content. Right, these three URLs go to the same page. <laughs> what this means is that you might be losing page rank. So before you had 20 links, now there's being dispersed, 10 to the first URL, five people are linking to the second, five to the third. So what you can do here is add to the head section of your duplicate and even your canonical version, this rel canonical. And this is actually gonna tell us, search engines being Google, also Yahoo and Microsoft have agreed to accept this standard, which you want as the canonical version of your URL. So now all those properties from the duplicates will be transferred to your canonical version. And your canonical URL will also be shown in search results. So you can let us try to do this clustering and dupe detection on our own, or of course you could set that yourself with rel canonical. Okay, before I get to adding content, nobody has questions if you wanna go to the mic? Good. Yeah. When you're talking about the uh, um number of, uh, extremely uh, large number of links on your site. What, what is that number? What, is, what do you consider extremely large? Um, so, yeah, usually that has to do with something that's nearly infinite. Meaning like a calendar that's going on and on. Ah. Or like a positional encoding. So like 30,000 isn't, isn't a lot. Oh, that is a lot, yeah. But, uh, it, it, you know, if we detect that you don't have that much content and we are seeing that much, we'll trigger that, that note to be sent. Okay. On the uh, canonical naming portion of it, is that limited just to a single domain? So if you have multiple domains pointed to the same website, can you point to the root domain as opposed to the one that, that is being indexed at the time? Uh, no, you need to, it only works within the same domain. Okay. Yes? On to your topic of session IDs, I've had trouble with um, the uh, session format uh, that Java uses. Uh, it's, it's a semicolon followed by a session ID and it seems that Google often indexes all of those. It's not recognizing that as a session ID. Okay, do you have a, um, a domain example? I can bring that back to our team. Uh, it'll just be J session ID, all caps. And anyone who's used Tomcat or Java. Oh, I mean, do you have a domain that actually shows this problem? Uh, these J, J, this particular form of session ID is often added by your container. So you'll have a website that doesn't have sessions at all, but when Google comes along and crawls it, okay. it'll get a session ID if you happen to be using uh, Tomcat and Java. Yeah. 
got you. But do you just have one example that we can, I can just make sure I take back to them where you're like, here's the problem I've seen on this site? Um, citycarshare.org has that problem. City Carshare? Citycarshare.org. Great. .org. .org, yeah. Okay. Perfect. You guys, I'd love to get more um, feedback on some stuff that you see because you're the best audience to get this from. So let me know. Yes. Um, I had one quick question about the flash. You were talking about um, that text is indexed mm -hmm. by Google now. Is it all text or just selectable text? It should be all text. All text? That's, you, that's visible to the user and not in an image. OK. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I have a question regarding the webmaster tools. Uh -huh. uh, you pointed out that um, uh, if you wanted a UK site, for instance, if you wanted a, uh, if UK you wanted a site that's targeted towards a uh, UK audience, uh -huh. are you better off using a .UK? Uh, basically, we, right now we have a .com, which is doing pretty good. And uh, I was wondering if we should get a uk.xyz.com to target the UK content, or um, basically currently our target is the North American market. But if we want to go so you're after about a subdomain? Yeah, so should, should we use uk.xyz.com, or should we say um, xyz.co.uk? Which, which, which would be a better option. I mean, this one already has a lot of authority with Google and, I guess, other search engines. So uh, w would I be better off uh, going with the subdomain on this one or, or just go to a completely different TLD? Yeah, those are, those are hard. Those are tough questions. Okay. Um, it kind of matters also for your marketing team. If you have a subdomain, are you looking to target a bunch of other subdomains, other countries? Eventually, I guess. Okay, so here's the thing. I mean, you could do studies on this. And you have to, it's a hard decision to make. But essentially, right, a user in the UK, he wants his site to appear for this user. If they see a .co.uk, they automatically know it's tailored to them, right? They're used to seeing that extension of the TLD. If they see a subdomain, are they as likely to see it? I don't really know. But from a ranking perspective, they'll both, we can target both of those to that area. So if you do a subdomain, then you're going to want to verify that webmaster tools and it'll be targeted to users in the UK. If you do the cctld.co.uk, it'll automatically target those users. So we're t we won't treat it as the same domain necessarily if you use a subdomain. Both are kind of viable options. Uh, I see, but uh, you'd be able to use the web webmaster tools to say, to choose, I saw your drop down box for yeah. saying th this one should be targeted to such and such audience. Mm -hmm. So can I do that with subdomains as well? Yes, oh, a verified beautiful. subdomain or subdirectory. Oh, beautiful. So you could say uk.xyz.com targets the United Kingdom. Oh, okay. Uh, and just a quick comment um, regarding the onclicks. Yes. I, I know it's not a new thing. Uh, you guys have been doing that for about a year. We started noticing that on my site a year ago because we were basically didn't want Google. To, we have a lot of inventory pages. We didn't want Google to target that. And one day we realized that your search engines were just coming in and going past the onclicks because we that was our robot.txt. So it's been going on for a while. Okay. Yeah. We're letting you know about our status. We kind of, as they say, turned the jets on uh, just recently. But yeah, we were trying to experiment. <laughs> yes? Hi. Um, do you know if .ws domains are generic or if they are country targeted? Because I know those have been released publicly recently. .us? .ws. Oh, I'm not sure what that corresponds to. Yeah, it's supposed to, it was a national code, but I think now it's just for website. So it's kind of like the .tv and stuff. Um, I think we would probably take the official version of what that corresponds to. I mean, I could check that out. Do oh. WS? Yeah. Okay. Right. And then, um, Sorry, I don't know all my TLDs. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, can you override that with the, um, the targeting and webmaster tools? If it's a dot WS? Yeah, and, and if, if it is... If it's considered a GTLD, you'll have that pull down. Okay. If it's not, then you won't be able to pull that down. So oh, okay, then I think it is, because I've seen it on there before. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, so we'll move on to the next section. So this is about adding content. So we'll start first with just text. Um, I don't like to get into this keyword talk, but keywords are important. If you want to rank for a certain word, you should use it on, in your text naturally. Um, one of my friends often jokes that uh, he worked for a shoe company who wanted to say, they said, we don't call it running shoes. We call it athletic footwear. <laughs> and that's great. They can call it whatever they want. But you want to adopt the, the language of your users. And it's not often that I would type when I look for running shoes, athletic footwear. Right? So a great thing to do is really use the keywords that people would search for. Of course, be readable and natural. You know, keyword stuffing, it's spammy to users, it's spammy to search engines. 
Now, if you want to add images, um, just some tips for you. For image search, here are some of the signals. We're going to look at the text surrounding the image. So having good text as well as good headings is helpful to help us understand what your image is about. Uh, additionally, the quality of the image matters. So you know you don't want anything placeholder. You don't want anything low resolution. Really, quality images are what we want to return to users. And another part is about image attributes like alt text. This is a great thing to add. Uh, we look at this very well. In fact, if you have just an image link, we'll actually use the alt text as your anchor text. So alt text is very important. And of course, good file names. Um, I don't know if you've seen that a little cat invisible Olympics. It's hilarious. Um, but you want to use file names that are hyphen separated versus the camera default, right? Which is like DSC. One, one, question, one question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned hyphen twice. What about the underscore? Is th is that worse? Uh, yes, it is a little worse. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hyphens will automatically be seen as word separators, whereas underscores are not seen as a, a full strength word separator. Okay. So I've been saving this one to talk to developers because, uh, because a lot of SEOs know not to do this and developers are only people I think are really savvy enough to know to do this. But it's not a good idea if you want to be found in search engines. Um, and the idea is they think, oh, you know what, I've got these images that have some text in it. So to let search engines know about my text or I will actually use uh, text index, negative 999. So we all know what this does, right? It's going to push it off the screen so no one can see it. But being a search engine, we understand that happens. Uh, so let me just tell you why this is a bad idea. The reason why it's bad is because this is a long time been around spam technique. <laughs> People love this. They put white on white text. You know, that's kind of hidden text. In this case, they're trying to put it off the screen. So we can find tons of examples of this. Again, I don't want to like shame anybody. But um, this site, you know, obviously did text indent, negative 999. And then they just put a whole bunch of links at the bottom, right? Try to like boost their links to other to other sites. Um, spam, penalty, you know, not going to do well. Uh, so if you want to do image replacement, it's I mean, if you want to just if you're using images, use alt text if possible. If not, try to do things like Ziffer, Sprite, um, even less too greedy is something like NoScript. But again, alt text is best than something like Ziffer and Sprite. Text indent, risky. Just want to make that clear. You can do it, but if you care about your rankings, not a great idea. All right. Again, just to let you know, um, we're trying to serve our users, but we also care about you, <laughs> for sure. So we actually will send messages if we think that you're a legitimate site doing something like this. So here's an example of a hidden text message in Message Center, where we let you know that we detected some of your pages that were using techniques outside our guidelines, and we go on. Again, we really just want to help you out here. Now for videos, this is all fairly basic SEO stuff. Um, but if you have videos, YouTube does a lot of good things. They have static HTML navigation, text descriptions, good titles. You can visibly see the popularity of a video. So you can see the views, you can see the ratings. They have comments that help users become engaged. Comments can also be a turnoff, but you know, um, it also keeps some people there. They have related videos that you can see that keeps, you, it keeps it sticky on the site, so you keep looking at more which I think we've all done. It's like an hour passes, and you're like, what am I doing? Um, and of course, the best thing about video optimization is to create a compelling video, right? One that people do want to share. And if you're hosting on your own, uptime is important. Uh, that's why YouTube kind of does so well in Meta Cafe. These are sites that we can rely on the uptime when we show them in search results to users. Yes? Uh, hi. Um, uh, we, we, wanted to, we, we see that if you have um, a uh, site that's targeting, say, UK audience, and you have, sorry, uh, and you have your um, servers in UK, um, it tends to do better on search engines, but, and, and that's fine, we can always rent a server in UK, but um, we're trying to go uh, to CDNs and to the cloud, and we, we're very much wondering how Google would treat if the whole site is hosted on the cloud, say. I mean, would, would, would they actually say that it's meant for UK audience or yeah. whatever? Again, the web server IP, I mean, that might be your experience, that your ones that are hosted in the UK do better, but that might not be the actual factor, right? It could be a lot of factors that lead to it doing better. So again, web server IP, I just mentioned that because it's, it's a very tertiary signal, signal, though. Again, first we're going to look at TLDs, and then wherever you host it, whatever cloud it happens to be in, um, 
you could actually target that in webmaster tools, right? So those are gonna be two strong signals. Web server IP, I'm just mentioning it because as you choose to host, I want you to know that that could be a factor. But if you have the other two covered, then you'll be fine. Yeah, you mentioned about the, uh, the text in that thing to basically hide content. Yeah. What about all the, you know, like, I know for our site, we have a lot of content that might be in, like, Coda sliders or, you know, potentially an accordion, so it's visibility hidden or, you know, what have you, opacity Display zero. Or something. Um, how yeah. do you, how would you ever uh, discern between, you know, legitimacy there and yeah. something being fraudulent? Um, okay, so another great thing about talking to developers is that almost they're always legitimate, <laughs> which is good. So, uh, you know, we realize that that's a lot, that a lot of code on the web does stuff like that, that uses display non visibility hidden. It's not something we're looking to penalize. Um, but we do think that there are other ways if you can figure out other ways, you know. But in some cases, that's all you can use. And I think you'd probably notice that those sites aren't hurt in ranking by any means, because we're aware of stuff like that. But, uh, I think text indent to us is just usually so flagrant. I mean, you might be doing it for good reason. So if you're doing text indent, Minus 999, we're not saying like take a whip to all those sites you're going down. That doesn't happen like that. We actually evaluate all of them, but that just becomes a signal that, that you're gonna be flagged. We consider that fairly risky. Um, so it's not a determinant of being penalized, but it's just something we wanna discourage. Yes? Um, do pages in the root directory get a higher page rank priority than anything under a subdirectory? Uh, no, they don't. Okay. I think the only problem that you might see, I mean this is ranking, you probably won't see a problem, but from user's perspective, if you go on and on and on in every subdirectory, then you might have some problems there. They might be less likely to share that link with each other, therefore you have less link love. Um, page rank can be affected. So it's still good to keep them fairly short. Um, but you know, getting beyond say 10 kind of be, becomes hard to handle. One thing about videos I wanted to mention as well is video sitemap. So this isn't part of sitemaps.org yet, but you could submit a video sitemap to Google, giving us a list of your URL, the thumbnail, and description, and then we can use that as we process your videos too. Okay, so responding appropriately. What this has to do with is response codes. So, we've got our domain, we are setting it up, we chose technologies, um, you know, we put stuff in the head, and now we're gonna talk about how do we respond to get requests. So here are the key response codes, 200s. That's your URL exists, that's straightforward. We don't want you to serve 200 if it's actually a 404. That's called a soft 404. Um, a lot of times people do that and redirect it to their homepage or try to do something like that. Um, in those cases, again, we're crawling and we're just seeing more duplicates. So there's no need to really do that. Um, just go ahead and serve a 404 when it's 404s. 301, this is important. If you have content that you actually wanna change the URL for, a 301's gonna do that because it'll say, 301 says it's moved permanently. So essentially we'll say, take everything from this source and move it to this target. So search results will have this target URL, not the first, not the source. So that happens with the 301. And all that link popularity goes from A to B. 404, file not found, same to us as a 410. Um, I often get discussions where like, what 410 means gone, and I just don't wanna do that. <laughs> so no, we treat that the same as a 410. And if you're gonna do temporary site maintenance, um, some things that we've seen developers do is, oh, I'm gonna robot out my site right now, or I'll no-index everything, um, because I'm gonna bring it down for a day. Uh, or maybe they'll say, I'm gonna serve 404s everywhere. And that's actually not our preferred method, uh, because a 404 signals to us that it's not around, right? If you give us a 503 when you do this, then we'll know to come back and check it again. So if you bring your site down, give a, go ahead and give us a 500 response code. All right, this is one of my favorite, maybe my favorite, feature. Uh, I'm gonna go with favorite um, in Webmaster Tools. And what this is, is uh, crawl errors. And so, actually, well, the next slide is my favorite, sorry. Here we'll show you um, response codes for uh, URLs that we've had problems with. And you can just go ahead and verify this. So there's things like URLs that are unreachable, URLs that timed out. If you have hosting problems, you can kind of notice some of that here, right? That you'll have a lot of timeouts or something. Okay, this is my favorite feature. Uh, now what it is, is crawl error sources. So it's part of this big movement, I don't know if you've heard, about cleaning up the web. Uh, and what you can do now is fix broken links. So inside your site, if it's verified, and we can show you crawl errors, now when you have a 404, we'll actually tell you for each URL where it was linked from, whether that's an internal link or an external link. See that, it's pretty powerful. 
Um, because now you can actually figure out more about who's linking to you. You could say, you could reach out and say, hey, you know, you could improve your user experience. This is actually the URL of my content, or you know, you misspelled this, or you mistyped this. Let's go ahead and clean that up so they can come straight to what you wanted. I think this would be fun because I think kind of that seamless web experience would be really fun as a user. So you can go ahead and clean up your 404s through crawl error sources. I noticed uh, I've been using the, the webmaster tools, and uh, I noticed that I have some uh, crawl errors on external links, and you know I don't know who these people are who link to me, uh, and they put in mistakes. How can I get them corrected or eliminated from? Okay. Got it. Did anyone hear that question? Um, so one answer, of course, is money. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what do you usually do? I mean, most people have right like admin at the address, and you can go ahead and email that. It's kind of a or webmaster at. Um, that's one good way to, to try it out. Uh, that's kind of the approach that we usually use to try to email people when we have messages and they're not verified in webmaster tools. In the past, we've just tried to do those admin or webmaster, some default so email alias. So it's up to me to correct it to the people linking. I can't just say this is a bad email. Yeah. I can't just say eliminate this. <laughs> no, it'll still exist on their site, right? Gotcha. So this questioner asked, good question, thank you. He asked, can I redirect that 404 to the appropriate page? Of course. Um, in that case, that's not a soft 404, right? You're actually saying, here's what they actually wanted, let's go ahead and fix that. Um, you could do that as well. But for me, I kind of like getting it to the source, like making that relationship and figuring out what they wanted. Um, but I'm a connection person. So, yeah. Um, I see that Google is uh, real slow with the 301s. If you put a 301 on some pages, it takes a, a Google up to a month or a long time to get to it, and I always wondered if I could put that in my XML. We have usually like a few hundred pages like that, so could, should I put that in the Google XML sitemap and with the updated date so that, because that it reads every few hours, and, and would there be a penalty if I did, uh, took that approach? It's, it seemed a little risky, so I never tried it, but. Um, I think in your sitemap too, you'd probably want to put the source URL, not the target, if you're, so that we crawl the old one and know that it's 301s. Th that, that's your, what I mean. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think the reason why the 301s might not be taking as quick effect is usually because we haven't crawled that content as readily, and it's just not getting through our index as quickly. So if, like you have a news site, right? We actually crawl index news really fast because it has to be shown to users really quickly. So we'll pick up things like 301s for those quick crawls that are quickly, always modified, fairly quickly. If you have static content that you just changed, it is going to take a while before we recrawl it and then before it gets through our pipeline. Yeah, I guess my question is, uh, would Google Can you think? Speed it up? Uh, yeah, speed it up. no, 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 no not, not, not quite that. Would Google think that I'm like fooling the bot by saying that this page is changed in the XML sitemap when all the change has been is a 301 to the 301 to another page? No, no? no. that'd be all right. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, since. Um, uh, the sitemap XML was uh, mentioned. Are, are you going to talk about it, or, uh, or relations between it and uh, the you know just regular pages? So sometimes people do sitemap in HTML. What's okay. what's the relations uh, between? Sure, those? I'm not going to talk about it, but I will now that you asked. Okay. okay, there's different types of sitemaps you can have. There's lowercase sitemap with lowercase s, which is like an HTML sitemap, right? Where you click on a tab and it says sitemap and it shows you the links and some type of navigation scheme group somehow. What we're talking about, that's good for users, um, and search engines can follow that you know, as well. But what we're talking about is an XML sitemap or just a sitemap that is purely based for search engines. And you can create this sitemap um, and submit it through Webmaster Tools or you can ping Google or ping Yahoo or ping Microsoft with that URL. Additionally, you could put this XML sitemap for search engines in your robots.txt file. So as you have all these disallow rules, you can also put sitemap colon and then the URL to your robots.txt file. Now, what this sitemap file does for us is it's a list of the URLs that you want crawled, right? It's not stuff, and it's not duplicate content or any of that. And we'll actually use this file um, to feed those URLs to our crawler, and then we'll then be processed, right? So it maximizes your chances of being crawled if you create a sitemap. But so do you understand that part of it? Okay. Sure. But the reason why I didn't talk about it as much here, um, I kind of mentioned it is that it's no substitute for good link architecture and strong URL structure. 
that makes any sense? So a lot of times people are like, oh, I didn't really link my stuff well, but I have a sitemap. You know, a sitemap is fine, but we're actually still, once we get that list of URLs, comes to our crawl team, and we have to prioritize what should be crawled when. We're not going to say, especially if you're a spammer or something, right? You gave us 30,000, we'll go crawl them right now. It doesn't happen like that. Again, we kind of apply some algorithms to it and try to be smart about it. So it's best to have strong link architecture within your site. And it's also, as a huge bonus, is just to submit a sitemap to us, or to create one and put it in your robots.txt file, and then it'll be picked up automatically by Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. So it yeah. really maximizes your chances to be seen by our crawlers. J just to clarify this question, uh, so I, I've seen sites where a sitemap is, uh, is not actually intended for users, but it, it looks like it was just, just dynamically generated to, to uh, you know, to uh, direct the crawler in certain directions. So, so sitemap creates, so, uh, has, has a lot of links and, and stuff. So uh, this thing versus sitemap XML. So what should I do? Should I do this one, both, or only a sitemap XML? Um, I'm not sure what that one exactly looks like, but a sitemap XML file for sure will be picked up, especially yeah. if you put it, declare it in your robots.txt or you submit it through webmaster tools. So the safe answer is to do a sitemap XML file, because that's the standard for us. Okay, so back to these 404s. <laughs> um, this was ugly. I don't know if you remember this. This is Google in the old days. Um, but in Webmaster Tools, uh, in our help center, we actually have some JavaScript code. And you just tell us what language, and we'll let you copy and paste this code that you can apply so that now you have these friendly 404s, right? So in the past, it just said not found. Now with this code, you'll actually, you might have closest match URLs that we found on your site. You can also get a link back to the home page, a search box, things like that, and a link to your sitemap file, too. So again, you know, a 404 is not a great experience for a user. It's going to happen. But when it does, give them some other way to stay on your site and find what they were looking for. All right, so now engaging the community. Uh, this part is, you know, kind of all the social media stuff you've been hearing about. First, um, I just want to give you this quote. This is from Clay Shirky uh, from this book, Here Comes Everybody. He says, for any piece of software, the question, do the people who like it take care of each other, turns out to be a better predictor of success than what's the business model, right? So this is all about building and engaging this community. So if you want to use a blog, um, how do you do this? Well, a good thing to do is not just to put anything out there. It's actually to become an authority, someone people look to, someplace that people go to to read your articles. Uh, use categories that are also keywords. That's important, too. Uh, and of course, keep your blog secure. Blogs are easily hacked. It's, you know, it's kind of becoming on the increase as well. And know that we give you hackable software warnings and webmaster tools. Again, we're trying to communicate more with you about how you can better your site. So I could list a whole bunch of things here, but I actually just give you this query term. If you query Matt Cutts SEO blogging tips, he's this guy we work with, he's great. Um, he actually will give you a whole bunch more that you can look at. So let's go to some FAQs. You might be asking, all right, should I publish my full content or just a snippet of my blog? Well, it's your own preference. Obviously, you have, if you want to do something with analytics. Um, but from Google's perspective, it doesn't make a huge difference. It's mildly better if we see the full content first, but you can do what you like. Um, just having been to a lot of conferences where we talk about stuff like this, most users do prefer to see the full content. But again, it's your choice. People also ask about duplicate content on their blogs. I have an archived link, and then it lists all the same blog posts, but now with a different URL. Can I robots.txt that out? And the answer is yes, of course. Again, just be careful and make sure you do it properly, but go ahead. So if you're asking this, what about tweets, right? Um, good question. Well, unlike blogs that use ping services to let everyone know when a new blog has been published, to let the search engines know, Twitter doesn't do the same thing, right? There's no ping service. So of course we will index tweets if we see them, but it has to be currently linked to on the web. So if it's linked to, then it can be found, crawled, and indexed and returned in search results, but it's not that automatic process that you see often with blogs. All right, so also when you want to engage the community, you might be thinking about comments and reviews. So some of the benefits of this is that it can help your users make an informed decision. It also helps them communicate with you with comments or communicate with each other. But just know, if you do, host com if you do want comments, I'd host it on your own site, rather than have them go to some third party where they might then engage in this third party site, right? Because a lot of it you're doing for the engagement. So 
while there are third-party comment sites out there, it's probably something you want to do within your site. Um, this is for kind of search-friendly reasons and also for user uh, stickiness. Oh, but you do need to moderate for spam. <laughs> Next, also, if you do reviews, um, let's say you want to sell women's high heels and you've got reviews of women saying, oh, this doesn't pinch my toes or like I could run in this or play basketball. That's terrific, but what you want to do is keep those reviews on the same page as your, as your main product, right? So they don't go to a separate URL to see that review because now you've got this product description of high heels, but then you have people commenting over here. You really want to put all that content that's relevant to that product on one page. So when people link and say, oh, I love this, you know, I just added some comments here, I love this product, and they share it with their friends, it's only that one URL that's being shared around and linked to. It's not these two separate URLs. So comments I'd usually keep on the same product page. Also when it comes to reviews, you might have seen this announcement. Um, at developer conferences, I always get asked about microformats, <laughs> so now I have an answer. Um, we just released rich snippets, and what this does is take uh, sites that are based on reviews or descriptions of people, which are set uh, social networking sites, and if they're marked up, um, something happened in my slides, it looks kind of funny, but if they're marked up in RDFA or with a microformat review or uh, age card, we can actually show that here. So you can see that snippet now has stars for um, the rating as well as price range. So that's done through microformats. We're looking to expand that as well. Okay, so about engaging the community. What can you do through webmaster tools? Of course, you could check your backlinks, right? This is a good way to see who's linking to you. You can find out who your fans are. Um, so you might realize you have audiences you never knew about. If I'm selling high heels, I'm thinking my audience is primarily women, it might actually be the case that there's a lot of men out there, you know, on these GQ or something that are like, actually, this is the new fashion. And if I start to check my backlinks, you know, see my server logs, that's where I can start to find out who's linking to me and where they're linking to. The next part about this is just to maximize your traffic. So, and Webmaster Tools will show you up to 100 queries now of the queries that brought your site up in search results, which are the impressions, as well as the actual results that people clicked on. And we'll show that for seven days, two weeks, or different months. So again, that's a lot of data here, and you can use that to actually maximize what you're getting impressions for and make sure you get that click through. So here's another way, you know, to understand your community and figure out ways to give them more of what they want. I wanted to end uh, this presentation with this question. So it's a pop quiz. Do you think it's better, um, I was actually asked this at an SEO developer meetup. Do you think it's better to create a good website or to start a social media campaign? So I'll let you think about that for a few seconds. So what I think this person's asking is essentially, if you take it to extremes, she was asking, would it be better to have the number one ranking or something, you know, be, you know, she could think in terms of these, like, is it better to have the number one ranking for this keyword or is it better to have hundreds of followers, you know, you're kind of looking at it two different ways. But I think what you actually need to do, and that's why I like this question, is just take a step back, okay, because we're not just talking about rankings, we're not just talking about followers. What you actually probably want on your site is conversions, right? It's not just getting that traffic, it's making a conversion. And that conversion can be anything. It can be purchasing a microwave, it can be hiring you as a freelance developer, right? There's a lot of things you might want, signing up for a newsletter. But, so if you look at that, so what I, you actually probably want is a conversion. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and how do people make conversions? Well, kind of using pseudo-psychology, I would say a lot of people make conversions when they feel that they're well-informed and comfortable, okay? And where they kind of get some of this information is either from their friends, like in social media, where they heard about you or they heard about your microwave, or they just kind of did a search and found your site, right? So there's still these two places where they can get information and then make that conversion. But I would say that most importantly, people want to feel comfortable, they often research. And when they research, they often go through a search engine to find your site or they'll come onto your site and actually read more about you. So while they might hear about you through some social media network, or you know, they might hear about you for, through a tweet. What they're probably gonna do in the end is wanna know more, and that's gonna usually come through your site itself. So when it comes to this question about creating a site or working in social media, I'm kinda old school, um, and I also work at Google, so I'm obviously biased, but I think if you create a site that's helpful to users, um, it's accessible on multiple platforms, whether it's a desktop or it's a mobile phone, and you make it easily found by search engines, 
then I think that's going to give you the best kind of conversion campaign and really help your, your business plan. Okay? So that's all I have for today. So I hope you could take all these tips, um, get out there, and really, you know, make your site great. So thank you very much.